encourage you guys and let you know that God, God is in control. And my mic is doing the same thing it did last week. And Josiah promised me that it was fixed. It was fixed like 10 but seconds ago. But it's not working. <laughs> so, I hope you guys can hear me. There's another mic right there. Testing, and testing. I don't know what's wrong with it. That one's not working either. Testing, testing. <laughs> you have to turn one of these on, guys. They're all yeah, on. Testing, They're testing, on. testing. Nothing is on. There testing, you go, testing. Testing, testing, testing. This one's working. There's something wrong with our system. <laughs> so, I don't know what that is, but God's in control and God knows. Maybe somebody isn't tuned in and they're going to be able to hear something because we spent 30 seconds on the mic. But God knows. God knows. So, there he is. So, if you guys don't know, we are in the middle of our series entitled... The Veggie Tales Effect. The Veggie Tales Effect, if you don't know what it is, it's basically I believe that some of us have Bible stories that we've been told since we were little kids. And uh, we know the little kids' version. And because when we read it, we think we know it, we don't really study it. So I was going to go through some, some very common Bible stories and just kind of dig deep. We started with Jonah. Then we went on to Matthew 14, where Peter walks on the water and Jesus feeds the 5,000. Now today we're going to start with a, a character in the Bible that even the unchurched, the completely unchurched people know. We're going to talk about Noah. Noah and the ark. So <laughs> Noah goes beyond the ark, but we're really, really going to focus on the ark. And the life of Noah. And it's going to be from Genesis 5 all the way to Genesis 9. We're going to read today, the study today, and look at. But um, we're going to start with Genesis 5, the very last, the very last scripture in Genesis 5 is verse 32. It says, After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And, I wanted Carrie to name our three boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, but she wasn't as spiritual as me and said we couldn't do it. So we have Jason, Josiah, and Isaiah. I guess they're pretty spiritual too. But um, after 500 years without kids, after Noah was 500 years old, Noah father Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 500 years with no kids. I think I would have built a fortune. In 500 years with no kids. But uh, I only had like 21. So, but just a few chapters over, we have Abraham at 99 talking about, I'm too old to have kids. So when I read this scripture on Noah being 500 when he has his boys, I wondered about Abraham. I wondered about Abraham because... How is it that Abraham can't have him at 99, but Noah had him at 500? And so what I read, I, I continued. Actually, after I read that, I called my mom. Because that's what people do. That's what mama's boys do. They call mom and ask mom for help. <laughs> and uh, mom says, I don't know. I don't know. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, thanks for your help anyway. So I left. And I started reading on. And then I got to Genesis 6. 1 through 3, and I read it. It says, When the man began to multiply in the face of the land, and daughters are born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. And they, they, I'm sorry. The daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives, and they chose. Then the, then the Lord said, My spirit will not abide in a man forever. For he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. So, here God says that men fell in love with women, and they took as many wives as they chose. And God realized that there's, there's a sin in men, and that they were messed up people. 
And then he says, I can't abide with them forever. I can't live with them for, for 900 years anymore. So their normal lifespan will be no more than 120. That's what he says. He says, I can't live with them. He says, my spirit shall not abide in, a, in man forever, for he is flesh. His days will be 120. So if you, want to, if you wonder why we don't have 500 years without kids, it's because men sinned. And God said, I can't live that long with them, so I'm going to only give them 120. The New Living Translation says it like this. It says, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. So after Noah got so mad that he was, after Noah got so mad at us that he, after Noah, I'm sorry, after Noah, God got so mad at us that he cut 700 years out of our lives, 700 plus years. So if you ever ask yourself how Methuselah lived to 969 years and you're only going to live to 100 if you hope. It's because we sin. Sin, sin has been our downfall since the very, very beginning. So let's go on. Let's go on. Chapter six, verse five through six. The Lord saw that the wickedness of a man was great on, in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of this, of his heart, was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him to his heart. I have been really, really upset with my kids in the past. I've yelled at them. I've spanked them. I've done some things to them that got people mad because they didn't like the way I was treating my kids. But the thing is, I've never, never thought about, I've never thought what God says here. I never thought, I never once regretted having them. And God says he regretted creating them. God was really, really upset at humankind. God was really upset. Uh, it says, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Let's read on. Verse 7. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals, and creeping things and birds of heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Not only did he regret making them, he was going to kill them. Never thought that about my kids. But God is a just God. And we always talk about how sovereign he is and how full of grace he is. But we forget that he's also a just God. And when we live continually in sin, God is going to punish us. God was really upset at mankind. Basically because of sexual sin. If you read all the way through verse 7. You're going to find it. Well, we did just read it. And basically it was talking about men wanting women, wanting multiple wives and wanting this kind of sexual stuff. It doesn't mention anything else yet. But God was really upset. He will, God will get to a point where he's simply done. It is great to preach about the grace and the love of God because God is a graceful and loving God. But we have to realize that God will get to a point where he is done. And he goes beyond what an earthly father will do. He will, he's going to kill him. He's going to send a flood and destroy the earth. He regrets creating us because of this sin. Don't think for a minute that COVID-19 couldn't be an act of judgment on us. It can the world is full of sin. Homosexuality, drunkenness, idolatry are all rampant in this world. I'm not telling you that 
that it is from God, that COVID-19 is from God. But I'm telling you that it very well could be. That God's a just God and we are a sinful world. We must change. We must repent. Last week I read 2 Chronicles 7, 14. But I felt to read verse 13. So I'm going to read you 13. And, and 14 today it says when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land so God is saying when I shut up heaven when I send, when I send a lack of rain, or when I send a whole bunch of locusts, or when I send a pestilence your way, that you need to humble yourself and pray. That that's when you need to do it. The contemporary English version says it says it like this, verse thirteen. Suppose I hold back the rain to send locusts to eat the crops, or or make my people suffer with deadly diseases. So it doesn't say pestilence. It says, or make my people suffer with deadly diseases. It sounds like what we're going through. The Good News Translation says it like this. It says, whenever I hold back the rain or send locusts to eat the crops or send an epidemic on my people. Isn't that the word we're using right now? An epidemic on my people? Epidemic, pandemic. The Living Bible and many others also use the word epidemic. The point is, is that God will use these things. He has in the past, and verse 14 tells us how to get past it. Humble ourselves. Pray. Turn from our wicked ways. I think, guys, that the best way to get past this is not social distancing. It's not staying in your house. That's not going to help scientifically but spiritually the best way to get past this is that we stop sinning that we pray and that we seek God we have to change as a world this world is not going to get better until mankind changes God is loving and caring but but he's God so many of today's preachers have sugar coated the word. We read all the good stuff and forget about that he is so just and that he will turn on us if we continue the sinful ways. Let's go on. So God is about to destroy all the earth. And then we read verse 8 and 9. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. There, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. You want to be the one that finds favor in the eyes of the Lord? You want to be the one that walks with God? We have to turn from our wicked ways. We'll skip a few scriptures and read verse 13. 13 says, And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them behold I will destroy them with the earth I find it interesting that until now the story has only mentioned sexual sin but here it mentions violence God hates all sin and disobedience it doesn't matter if you're murdering if you're adult, idolatry, pride, whatever your sin is, and we all have them, God hates it. And he's going to destroy us for it. Verse 14, a, the beginning of verse 14 says, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. It goes on to give, excuse me, it goes on to give the specs and instructions on how to make the, the ark. But we're going to skip all that. We're going to go to 17 and 18. 17 says, For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. 
and which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. I'm sure Noah's like 500 years without kids. Noah's like 500 years without kids. Yeah, I have three boys. And then you tell me to go hide in an ark? Like, 500 years without a cruise, God. And then I have kids and you're like, yeah, take them all. Yeah, that's what God did to Noah. You couldn't have done this when it was just me and my wife, God. Now I'm stuck in this cruise ship with them and their wives and us. Talk about quarantine. <laughs> like, Noah was stuck in an ark, and we complain about being stuck in our house. We can go outside, but God shut the door on Noah. We'll read that in a little bit. But sounds familiar, though. He can't go anywhere. He doesn't have YouTube. He doesn't have Facebook, he doesn't have online, he, doesn't, he, can't, he can't go order delivery. But what he does have is every animal in the world. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. It might spend spending time with all these animals. It might have made time fly by. You have to feed them and work and all that. And it might have been just too much work. It might have actually hurt them. But nonetheless. But nonetheless, Noah was stuck on an ark with his kids and all these animals. God goes on and tells him to take two of every animal. He says, take two of every animal, bird and creeping thing. What's a creeping thing? I guess it's insects, bugs, spiders. Noah could have left them off the ark for all I care, but he didn't. So he got all these birds, animals, and creeping thing. And then God tells him, also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It doesn't say toilet paper. It says take all sorts of food. But nonetheless, sounds familiar, right? He's storing up because there might not be food in the future. Then verse 22 says, Noah did this. He did all that God had commanded him. He did all that God had commanded. Chapter 7 starts with two things that we have already heard. I believe that when God repeats something, it's because he really wants to make sure we hear it, right? So chapter 7 starts with something, with two things that we've already heard. So 6 ended with one of them. Noah did this. He did all that God had commanded. So 7 says this. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark and you and your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. So we've read that earlier in chapter six. We've read that God that God found Noah righteous. So if he wants us to see that, God protected him because he was a righteous man. He repeated it. When God repeats something, he wants us to hear it. Like, I tell my kids, don't make me say that again. Like, God's saying it again. Like, you got, you got, when God says it again, you have to make, you have to open your eyes a little bit. So again, we see that God said no because he was righteous. We must also be righteous. He goes on and tells Noah to bring seven pairs of clean animals and a pair of unclean animals and seven pairs of the birds. He tells them it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Let me tell you this, he tells him to bring the clean, more of the clean animals than the unclean animals. And that's because he wanted Noah to be able to make sacrifices to him. I encourage you that during this time, find some time to sacrifice to God. Give to God, still, the church still needs money. Still need tithing. That's not what I'm talking about, but we do need that, so I'll plug it in there. But God needs our time right now. We're done past the times that, like Noah, where we're sacrificing animals, 
but we can sacrifice praise to him. We can sacrifice minutes of our life to him. We can read the word. You have nothing else to do. Many of you are complaining that you're stuck at home. I've read your Facebook pages. You're complaining that you're stuck at home. Give some time to God. Sacrifice to God. But then I told you that chapter 7 starts with two things. The first thing was that he was righteous. And then it goes on. In verse 5 he says, And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Chapter 6 ended with, Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. And then chapter 7 starts with it. When God tells you to do something, especially in a time like this, you better do it. If God is telling you to find somebody and give them your last roll of toilet paper, you know, I laugh and that's funny. But if God's telling you to do that, do it. If God is telling you to go help your neighbor, do it. Like, don't be afraid. Don't think you're going to contact the virus. If God's telling you to do something, do it. Noah did all that God asked him to and Noah was saved. We need to do all that God asked us to do. If you want to be seen as a righteous man in God's sight, start doing what he tells you. God speaks to us all differently. In times like this, he speaks though. God speaks. He'll tell you to love people. He'll tell you to be creative. He'll tell you some great creative ideas on how to help people. God will tell you some things that if you do, many people will laugh at you. No one probably got laughed at for building an ark when it had never rained before. But God, no one did it. And I encourage you just to do what God is asking you. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to skip down to verse 10. And it says, And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. Must have been seven awkward days. Like, okay, you tell your family, God told me this is going to happen and we need to get on this ark. And then you get on there and you would think that the second you get on there, God makes it rain. But it seems to me like they waited seven days before the rain. I, my dad told me that he's going to build an ark and God told us that we need to get on it. Okay, dad. But it's five days, six days in and there's no rain. I'll be like, dad, you're crazy. I think I might jump off. So... It must have been seven awkward days. People were still living. People weren't quarantined. It was only Noah quarantined. Let me tell you this. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Just do your part. Just do your part. If you feel that God has told you to quarantine, quarantine. If you feel that God has told you to do whatever you need to do, do it. God is your boss. God is the one who's going to tell you. How to live your life and if you if you live your life by that rule you're gonna be okay people are still living no rain was coming down people even his kids probably doubted him he did what God told him to anyway and then the flood came 40 days and 40 nights of rain and Noah's probably like how do you like me now like, yeah, I was right, huh? Like, Noah probably wasn't like that because Noah's probably a better person than I am. <laughs> but I think I would have been like, ha! Ah! Noah wasn't that way, though. Because Noah was righteous in the eyes of the Lord. So we're going to go on. We're going to go to verse 22 and 24. It says, Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. Everything that breathed through his nostrils was dead. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Everything that breathed was dead. But God took care of the righteous. God will take care of us. He will get us through. We all know that he that he sends that we all know what happens next. Noah sends out the raven and the dove 
A dove comes back with an olive branch, and they know there's dry land. But then verse chapter 8, verse 18 through 19 says, So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his Noah went out, and his sons and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on earth, went out by families from the ark. I found it interesting that he sends them out by families. It's this time that we're stuck together in our house. It's hard. We're all angry and spiteful and yelling at each other because it's frustrating that we're stuck there. But family's what we got right now. I just want to encourage you to love your family. Don't get angry. I know it's hard. It's hard for me. I've seen it in my own family. But try hard just to love and appreciate that you have them. Because right now it seems like that's all we have. So he goes out by family. He finally got out. So I see they're in this ark for forever. And they're finally out. I kind of see Noah being like Aladdin. When Aladdin pops out of the lamp and he says, 10,000 years will give you such a crick in the neck. Like, I see Noah saying that. He's out. There are many things I would have done, but Noah does something I probably wouldn't have done. And here, so all this time we read Noah's righteous. Noah's righteous in the eye of the Lord. But we never see Noah doing anything for God until now. Noah comes out of the ark. The crick of the neck is still there. And then he says, verse 1 and 22, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again strike down every living creature as I have done, while the earth remains seed time and harvest. Cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. He promised he's not going to kill us all again. Like, have some faith and believe in God's promises. He's not going to destroy us. If we read the book of Revelation, it doesn't talk about COVID-19 or the coronavirus. It talks about some crazy whack stuff that is way beyond what we're going through right now. This is not the end of the world yet. Beginning of the end, maybe, but we're not dying yet. We're not. God's got us. God has us. He promised he's not going to kill us all again. And then later he gives them the rainbow, promising that he will never flood the earth again. That says in 13, I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Because I've seen that. God says, I set my bow in the, in the clouds. And I thought about old time weaponry and how they would probably kill animals. And I thought, a bow. And God put a bow in the sky. And I said, I, for one time, you carry a bow and arrow. And God put a bow in the sky. And I, just, I associate it with death. It's probably not there, but it's something I saw and I just, I found it interesting that he says he put his bow, not a bow, but his bow, it says. 14, when I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become, flood, become a flood to destroy all flesh. He promised in these two scriptures, he's not going to kill us all. He promised... He's not going to kill us all. He's not going to kill us all by flood. He's definitely not going to use the flood. And when he did, he found a way out for the righteous. So he tells us in the story that 
I'm not gonna kill everybody again, but when I, even when I did, I found a way out for the righteous. I found a way out for Noah. If God's going to hurt us, if God's gonna take this world on, he's gonna find a way out for us. We're, as believers, we are okay. We're okay, guys. Just believe that. Don't fear, don't panic. We're okay. You might ask, what if I'm not perfect? What if I'm not righteous? Noah was perfect and righteous in God's sight. Well, Noah wasn't perfect. I want to tell you that we've all sinned. And the story of Moses, the story of Noah ends in the perfect way. Because he comes out, he worships God. And then this happens. And this is the most important part of the story of Noah to me because it shows that we don't have to worry about our sin. We don't have to worry about what we've done in the past or what we're going to do in the future. That we are righteous when we seek God and when we pray. Let me read it to you. It's kind of long, but I have to read it. It says, Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. He's naked in his tent and drunk. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered their naked, the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Just give me a second, I gotta take a drink. It says, they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest had, had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servants. And God enlarged Japheth. And let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Noah wasn't perfect, people. He got drunk and naked in front of his kids. And then when he woke up, he got angry and cursed the kid for it. There are many reasons I could go into about why he cursed the kid. And we can go on to battles with the Canaanites and all kinds of stuff. But what I want you guys to hear today is simply that no one wasn't perfect. So don't worry about what you've done or what you're going to do, but just focus on God and just do what he says, you're gonna be okay. We are going to be okay. This is nothing. God's done it before and he'll do it again. You just need to seek him and ask for repentance. I can't say repent enough. We must repent of our sins. Focus on God, seek God. And there has never been a time where it's been easier than right now when we're stuck in our homes. We just need to seek Him and ask for repentance. God has got us. If you're watching and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, bow your head and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just love you, and we thank you, Father, for always being there for us, Father. And it is 
because of your faithfulness that we believe. I ask you, Lord, that you come into my heart and that you forgive me of my sins, Lord, so that I can know you better than, before, than ever before and know that I'm safe. Lord, I thank you for everything. Amen. Pray. If you said that prayer with me, reach out. I'd love to talk to you. Message me on Facebook if you have no other way. My page or the church page. Find me. I want to talk to you about this. It's the best decision of your life. Even if you didn't pray that and you have some questions, reach out to somebody. We want to help you. We want to answer your questions. We want to be there for you because that's what Christians do in this time. I love you guys and I thank, I thank you guys. We're going to get through this. God takes care of the righteous. Let's have a good week, a blessed week. Let me pray and then we'll close. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just love you, Lord, and I thank you for everything you do, Lord. I thank you for showing us in your scripture, God, that, that you are there for us, Father, and you always provide a way out for the righteous, Father, and that righteous doesn't mean perfect. We thank you, Lord, for that, Father. I thank you that you're going to get us through this. I pray, God, that you just help us, Father, get back together. We need to be together. But your word says to forsake not the assembling of others in Hebrews. And so we need to be together. And I pray Lord, that you help us get through it. Help us get together. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hey guys, have a blessed week. I love you and I appreciate you.